what's our what's our lesson today? Oh, there's several of them. Um, you know, I go through. Again, I just want to ask before we get started here. Um, volume okay on my end? Yes. Okay. Um, usually, what I try to do each week is like uh, I go through my toolbox and I look for interesting tools that you guys might want to take a peek at. Things I still use. Sometimes I don't use as much, but. Uh, I can assure you pretty much everything in my toolbox is there because I have a use for it. The second toolbox behind me here has got some of my things. I don't need triple sets of things, feeler gauges and things like that at work. But uh, at work, most of the stuff I do use, at least occasionally. So I'll start off with that. Then I've got a couple emails, a couple questions people uh, asked I thought you may uh, have an interest in. And then I'm going to go through some setups I've been working on lately, or actually a couple older ones. Um you know, I've probably got 5,000 pictures at my disposal. So uh, between uh, my lessons online, this new thing I'm doing now, um, the calendar I'm producing, our 2021 calendar, um, I've got I, I, way too many pictures. I've got a lot of pictures. So there's always one I can look through and say, you know what, that'd be a good lesson. So um, plus the stuff I'm doing at work, I take as many pictures as I can there. Then I come home and I go through those to see, what the lesson might be from any of those. So um, I guess my, to answer your question, there'll be several mini lessons tonight. How's that? Sounds good. We have a couple more minutes here, then we'll get started. I'd like to start right on time. I threw you a discussion item, not for this this chat, but about uh, K&E borescopes. And I'd like to hear your opinion on that when you have an opportunity to comment on it. I will tell you right now, unfortunately, I have never seen one of those. And uh, in my uh, position in the trade, um, you're, I believe that was in reference to sc scraping in some ways or something like that. Am I right? Yes. Yeah, I've never had to do that. Um, uh, you know, we had the, back in the day when Erie was really big in manufacturing, we had guys in town that was their job. And uh, you either bought a new machine or had, if it was a big, big machine, you'd have these guys would come in and rebuild the machine. And, you know, by that time I had my shop and I was personally as the owner busy enough, I couldn't really go out there and watch them scrape the ways. And some of the guys I hired to do that actually came in at night. So I was already gone, uh, you know, 8 p.m. So I never really got into into that. It's fascinating, but unfortunately I cannot shed any light on that subject for you. And I apologize for that. But um, you know what I will do? Uh, I don't know. I, I, there seems to be a lot of interest. I, I watch videos occasionally online. Uh, a lot of people want to learn how to scrape ways and surfaces, and, and uh, I've just never done it. So um, I could probably get somebody to do a little presentation on that if you guys would be interested in that. Hi, Frank. How you doing, Phil? Good. There's a, a YouTube video on uh, scraping ways. I think there's several, actually. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't look like it's for the... You know, it doesn't look too exciting, but I guess, you know, that's. Well, you know, the only thing I will do once in a while at work, because we're an ISO company, they come in there once a year and uh, check all our surface plates. And that's fascinating. But the, uh, the guy's great, but he won't let me film him. It's all trade secrets. He won't. He, uh... Yeah. So he, <laughs> he gets the indicators out and he does his figure eights with his diamond compound. And he's got these dual millions indicators mounted on a uh, rail and everything's got to be within three millions i think for our grade of work so anyway wow. yeah it's pretty interesting but he comes in and scrapes all a day he can get he probably but does 20 or so plates in one day the biggest ones in our inspection department of course we've got like a what five by ten uh surface plate there he, he go he takes care of that one the same day too but uh, yeah, every year they come and grab my surface plate at my workstation and off it goes so with that being said we we're going to get started i always like to get started on time and uh, for those of you who've been here for uh, my first two classes, a uh, couple things um, before I turn it over to Mike for a, a few minutes tonight. Just as I said before, I'm not going to read this whole thing. You know, um, these are ideas that I've used for years, and uh, I have never been the type of guy that's. Uh, what I just did, I must have bumped my mouse. <laughs> I've never been the type of guy that's uh, my way the highway. I've learned from everybody I've usually worked with. And these are just ideas uh, to give you guys maybe an aha moment to give you a different way of looking at a new setup 
to just show you some of the things I do. And, and one of the things I always like to make sure I make clear, and that's why I enjoy this so much versus just doing this on YouTube. A, it's the interaction. But um, uh, the, the, the whole thing is, is I still do this for a living every day. And, and uh, I'm expected to get this stuff. The reason I have my job is to get this stuff done right and quickly. Because I have a little saying, it's that anybody can do anything if you give them way too much time to do it, right? So um, that's my specialty. And showing you guys how I make one of this, two of that. Occasionally do a little production run, but usually not more than 10 pieces. All right. So uh, these are the little secrets and tips and systems I've come up with over the last many years to, to get those jobs done. So, again, this is the way I do it. It doesn't mean it's the only way to do it. So I'm just a, I am just a, uh, a little clearinghouse for ideas to give you guys some thought process on how I work. And then uh, I'm always open to questions or interpretations. I'd rather do it like this than try to uh, answer the comment section on YouTube. I think that makes sense. So um, with that being said, uh, our first uh, two classes, uh, we've had uh, one of our consistent um, uh, attendees has been Mike Kelly. And uh, Mike and I were chatting about, he's, uh, he's a little bit more uh, familiar with the Zoom platform because apparently Mike uses this a lot for his work. But uh, Mike's in Duba, I believe would be 3D printing. And is that correct, Mike? Right. And uh, he sent me a few pictures of some st stuff he's doing. So I know I show you what I do every day, but there is new technology. So uh, I thought Mike could do a little presentation for us tonight and some of the stuff he's doing with 3D printing. So if you're ready, go ahead, Mike. Great. Uh, if you can, I'll do my share screen. You just got to do stop share, Phil. Okay. What's everybody doing? Good. Well, good. real good. Excellent. You should be able to see a screen now. It says 3D printing in the machine shop. Everybody? Yeah. That's it. Okay, Mike. I'm, Mike, I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody except for you. If I, I don't think you'll get muted as a host. It's okay. Yes. If I do mute you, we'll figure that out. Hold on. I allow. I'm allowing participants to unmute themselves. If we can't hear you, just go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, you're unmuted, so we should be good. All right, great. So, uh, yeah, I was shared some uh, pictures with Phil about something different. Um, so, but how it relates to all of us and sort of our love for machining, I think. Uh, I think, as Phil said, we all come from different backgrounds. Some of us are in this uh, as a trade all day, and some of us are more hobbyists. I'm an engineer, so I don't get to work in the shop as much as I would like to. Um, but this is my home shop. So I have a bridge port at home. It's an old proto track. Um, and how I use 3D printing, because you probably heard about 3D printing um, and what it is, uh, but you probably hear about it more as a toy. Like I can 3D print a toy. Uh, my company makes 3D printers for industry. So real applications where you can use this stuff. Um, if you look at my video, we all know what this is, right? Calipers. Mm -hmm. And we have a caliper case that looks probably store-bought, right? This is 3D printed. So I had a need, I need a, a caliper case, hold my caliper, um, you know, keeps it protected. So that's one of the things. How do we use it in the machine shop, I guess, is where we're trying to look at this today. And Phil, I'll try and keep this quick. You uh, you cut me off whenever you want to. Bye. Um, so here's my bridge port. Uh, anybody notice anything off or anything look unusual besides the proto track and the buttons up in the corner? Look standard, right? Pretty pretty standard. I see a big handle. Yeah, big handle. So how about now? Does anything look weird here or non-standard? Just the handle the wheel, right? Yes. The handle wheel, which nobody has anymore, right, right. <laughs> is rarely in any shop. Um, but that handle wheel um, was missing on mine as it is on everybody else's generally. Um, and I found, you know, it's, it's great to use as sort of a fine feed. Um, I needed a handle, but I could have bought one on McMaster. I could have machined one, but I just printed one. So I designed a handle and I printed it. This is out of plastic. Um, it's perfectly functional. This is nylon plastic with chopped carbon fiber in it. So it's very robust, can't break it. 
it's really impervious to coolant and everything else because it's nylon. So that's one way you can do it. You can do handles, things like that. Here's another thing. Um, this is where I put my dead blow to set parts in the vise. So it just fits right in a T-slot and it looks like you could buy it, right? Nobody would know, holds the handle all day. I throw the hand, uh, hammer in there, it's not a problem. So there's the hammer. Um, so you make this on a 3D printer. This is a marketing photo, obviously. Uh, but you know, that's a 3D printer, looks like a little desktop thing. And pretty much what it does is melt plastic, squirt it out into a 3D shape. It does it in layers. If any of us have ever had an MRI or a CAT scan, same idea takes the image by cutting everything up into layers. You stack all the layers, you get a 3D shape at the end. So 3D printer, that's all it does. It takes plastic, melts it, squirts it out like a hot glue gun in a shape, in a pattern. Pretty straightforward. Uh, what's cool is now we can do that in metal. So this is the thing I thought would be really cool to share with this crew because um, you probably haven't seen it. You probably heard about plastic 3D printing, but not metal. So like I said, I'm an engineer, which means I'm lazy. Uh, and I don't like to do anything that I can automate or, or make better. So the knee crank handle, right? We all know this, love it, hate it. Depends, depends how far you have to go on any job. We know a solution. A lot of us have made one of these. This is uh, sort of a, a knee adapter um, where you machine it and then you chuck it up or in a drill and then you can drive your knee up and down, right? It's very cheap. All of us who can machine something and do that. This is one I've made many years ago. Uh, the knurling is terrible. It's pretty beat, but it works absolutely fine. Made it on this bridge board. So you take it, you take your handle off, you put it on the knee right there. Great. Now I was, I did a bad design here and I was like, oh great. Now I have to drive this. So I grab a socket with the drill adapter, stick it on there. Now I got a drill motor on there. And you can drive this up and down. We've all seen this, I think, in one variant or another. We've been around shops for a long time. You can buy this, this type of thing. So what's the problem with my setup? Well, it was a bad design, and it's really long. <laughs> it's about five and a half inches, and then you throw the drill motor, and it sticks out there, right? So I'm lucky enough I have access to metal 3D printers, which are pretty cool. So I was like, okay, I need to make a new one of these that isn't as bad as this and that's cool for 2020, you know, something really cool, let's 3D print it. So I made a new one. So here's the design in CAD. This is what it looks like. It kind of actually looks like, uh, like the Apollo <laughs> space capsule type has that feel. But the feature that we all know that needs to meet up there with the knee and then it tapers back and then it comes to a hex and it's, uh, <clears throat> hollow inside, right? Because we have the shaft there. So here's a section view. This is what it looks like if you were to cut it in half, right? So this is what we're going for. It's what we want to make. So I have this metal system. This is the company I work for. Uh, to get a metal part, you need to print it here in the printer. Then you have to wash it. So essentially it's a solvent degreaser that takes away a bunch of wax and other stuff in there. And then you put it in a furnace and you turn that thing into metal. So it's essentially metal powder that you are printing that's bound in wax and plastic. Put it in the wash, you get rid of the wax, put it in the center, all that powder now turns to metal. It's pretty cool. So in our software, this is what it looks like. The purple is all the support structure, right? So we're printing this in layers. So you have to support uh, the additional layers. So all the purple is support material. The yellow is a raft, it's sort of a base to carry it through, and the whitish is what the part's gonna look like. It's kind of a hard picture to look at. Here is a section, here's one of those layers if you were cut it. This is layer 36 of 577. This is what it would look like, so 577 layers and all the kind of stats. Um, and this is layer 431 of 577, so much higher up in the part. So I printed it. This is, uh, I printed another one of these last week so I would have photos to show you guys. Here's it being printed. Here it is when it's done printing. It's 20 hours to print, but it's hands off time. Then it goes in the wash, marketing photo. And then it goes in this furnace and you get it apart. Here's the metal part at the end. This is 17.4 stainless steel printed. Uh, this is the one I use on my mill all the time. So the chuck jaws are kind of of the drill 
show it here. And this is the raft that kind of carried it through the process. Here's what it looks like off this material. That's the surface finish of that interface. Here's a part in hand. So now when you put it on here, slides on, fits beautifully, throw it on the drill, and we cut, you know, three inches off of that and did something pretty cool. So that's what I want to share. Um, Mike, can you hear me? Am I still, uh, I'm still good? Yep. Yeah. Um, quick question. Um, you said it took 20 hours to do. You did mention that the finish, you can easily file that finish up very quickly, right? It's very easy. Oh, to yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the marks are very light, right? Yeah. I believe you said you filed out the teeth on, on that particular one, right? I touched up the teeth, yeah, uh, with a file just so they'd fit and, and just used a hand reamer on the inner bore just to clean it up because there's a seam. Uh, James asked if the center part, like an oil light bushing, is it porous and can absorb oil? Um, it's 17.4, so it's not going to absorb oil like, like you know, a, a bronze bearing type wood because um, it's a different material. Here's uh, the parts. So here's the finished one in metal. And here it is printed uh, next to it. It's kind of like a hard clay before we put it in the furnace. That's, the, that's what it's like. And you can see the size difference because it shrinks about 20% in the furnace. Wow. Interesting. Now, I know there's difference of uh, an expense in these type of machines. I know there's ones that a guy like me can buy for my studio, right? My house. Uh, I see a lot of the stuff on, online. Um, how, how much of an expense for the average guy to get in something to be able to print metal like that? I know we talked lightly about this before. I mean, it could be very expensive depending on how big you want to go though, right? Oh yeah. So, I mean, a, a plastic printer that we see maybe on Amazon, things like that, that exist for a couple hundred dollars can do the little toy things, right? But you can't do anything with that part. You could, can't put any load on that. You can't, it'll break, right? Um, this metal system, again, it's three machines, is about $125,000, just to put in perspective, um, to, do, to do metal 3D printing. Now you are actually in the business of, of you. You're, you work for this company, correct? Yep. Who's your big market? Who 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 do you target for something like this? So we actually do a lot of with companies that probably we're all familiar with, but um, inside those companies for prototyping. Right. So what you do is you buy one of these systems for the engineers, and you let the engineers do their first three, four, five cycle, you know, design cycles on something. Um, on their own and then when they get to final like proof then they bring it to the shop and get it made for real because we can't hold the precision that we can hold in the shop right now we're close um, you know we're talking a couple of thousands you know maybe plus or minus 10 depending on the size of of the object um, again we printed this and then we have to account for how much it shrinks and it went through a furnace and it like twists and bows and all kinds of stuff um, so we see this really great for prototyping where the engineers can just kind of do it on their own in the corner and they don't need the experience. I mean, they just send it to the printer, it prints. They, they don't have to interact with the machine. They don't have to set up tools. They don't have to understand what it means to climb a conventional mill. Like they don't have to worry about any of that. So that's where we see it used a lot. I know um, uh, one of my uh, friends on Facebook works in aerospace and they've been actually printing uh, uh, prototypes in Inconel. Yep. And uh, which kind of blew his mind. He's about my age. He couldn't believe it because he's been working with ink and all his whole life. And he did explain to me they had a port that normally they they wanted to make a uh, come in and go out the side. Well, usually that's two holes. On this one, they could just they could that, that you didn't need the, the the plug on the other end, right? They just formed it with the uh, L shaped hole right in it. The only problem I would have with that though is if that was a prototype. The engineers could walk out and say, I want I want that now in the machine <laughs> part, right? <laughs> it's always a danger. You gotta watch out for those engineers. Yeah. Uh, you do. So what's the name of the company? Uh Mark Forged. Mark Forged? Yeah. Uh, um, so I'll I'll make sure when I post this in the members area, um, that I will put some contact information up there for you if anybody wants more information or send it to their boss or whatever. Um, anybody else out there have any other comments, questions about this? Frank, are you guys doing anything like this at school yet? 
Uh, no, actually, uh, if someone would like to donate a uh, machine, <laughs> you know, I'll take charge of it. And, you know, uh, I'll buy a lunch. A uh, couple lunches. Yeah, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll take one, too. Okay. Uh, if, if you have a few. Uh, I do have a question about, um, uh, about this, uh, Mike. Uh, you mentioned the support structure. So, you know, what happens with plastic 3D printing is then you get, kind of get this fuzz, this forest uh, of struts underneath. Um, how do you do that in metal? Is that a filler material or is it actually a metal forest? Yeah, so in this part, right? So this is the final part. And obviously that's hollow. And if you remember the section view, uh, there's a roof there, right? So uh, this is the support material. The support material is the same material. It's still 17.4, it was printed with this. So essentially because it has to all shrink together at the same shrink rate in the furnace, it has to be that material. So your support material is the same material you print with. And then the interface, like where you wanna separate them we print one layer of a ceramic release material between them. So essentially that turns to powder in the furnace and then you can break them apart. You can like- That is them. seriously cool. It is cool stuff. It is. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, I'm almost, I, I think we could just end now. You've done such a good <laughs> job. It was really good. Thank different, you. it's different. Very cool. Now, anybody, any of you guys uh, know people? I mean, I love to bring different people on besides myself. I've got. You know, I mean, I've done a lot of different things in my career, but, uh, you know, it's hard for me to do a live lesson and have an EDM machine here and, and do that stuff, right? So it's really always great to hear new technology. Uh, as I told Mike earlier, back in uh, my mold making days, uh, um, I had my shop back in the 90s. Um, I did a lot of work for the toy industry. And uh, uh, back then, you know, if they really were desperate, they'd pay us to make a quick prototype mold, which is, you know, I mean, we'd make it out of aluminum, but... Uh, then they came out with the SLA models. I don't know if you guys were ever heard of that stereo lithography, uh, I believe it was called. Is that, is that right, Mike? Stereo lithography? What was it? I don't remember what the A stood for. Um, but yeah, yeah, but it was very, like he said, very thin and brittle. But you could at least get a look at what the concept was. You didn't if you dropped it, you were done. I I actually might have a few down down here too. I, I had one of an apple, a bank I made. And we have an SLA model, and it's just white and very brittle, but um, it, it got the concept of so the customer could actually feel it and touch it and say, you know, I, I want this a lot cheaper than, I guess, building a, uh, a prototype injection mold. So, okay. Uh, any other questions for Mike? Thanks, Mike. Anybody else? Well, right. I got one. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead uh, Mike, so, you know, you... You print this and you in, you specify the dimensions you want to hold, okay? And it initially, after it's printed, it's larger, right? About 20% larger than what you expected. And so uh, when, you, when you finally, after you put it in the furnace and you get it, you know, fired, uh, it's, we said within about, Ten thou of your okay. okay. Yep. So you know our software know. just okay. you just take your model, like what you really want, you give it to our software, and our software scales it all up. And oh, okay. You don't have to worry about it. Okay. And then, so we are trying to shoot to hit your model. Um, that's our. That's what I do. Twelve hours okay. a day is okay. sort out problems. Why we're not hitting your model, right? That's that's my job. Um, but yeah, that, that's what we try and do. Okay. And I just realized they had a copper part too. Oh, neat. Wow. Pretty cool. Like there's a heat sink that we could never really machine. Wow. And that's copper. So that's, that's cool. Very, too. cool. Very cool. Last question. How big do these things get? How big a part can you really 3D print? Like, like this. In practical terms. Right. Like a, a softball is kind of... Close to our limit, okay. metal. In right. plastic, we do plastic. We go way bigger. Okay, how about in plastic? How big can you go? Uh, we make a printer that can go, you know, pretty big. Okay. All right. I'll make one quick comment. I remember in a trade show, 
probably back in around 2000. The military, of course, had uh, this technology for repairing tanks. And I think that during like the Desert Storm era, um, keeping spare parts on hand for whatever might fail became challenging. And so they would just keep a pile of, uh, you know, the, the, the powder and go and print whatever they needed to uh, repair a tank well enough to get the tank back home. Um, I found that very interesting. Didn't they actually over in Iraq build a whole barracks out of printed parts? I can't have to look that up. I think they actually did that. I'm, I'm sure they did yep. everything and more. Yep. All right. Uh, well, Mike, thank you. That was great. Good information and uh, love the new technology. So um, I'll continue on with uh, uh, my part of the lesson. So um, I guess for now, we'll just leave this view until I bring up the slideshow. As I mentioned, uh, I got a few emails. And uh, one was just a simple one from a fellow who just wanted to know, uh, uh, he said, good evening, Mr. Kerner, recently started as a precision manufacturing company here in Southwestern PA, being hired and uh, trained in basic tool making, some die assembly. And he wanted to know if I have any recommendation for brand of safety shoes, safety toe shoes. So um, I've always had, and this is probably very subject, and he'll be glad that we address this, because I'm sure there's, there's many people on here have different opinions. I don't wear high tops, personally, it's just a pre preference for me. And I have to wear steel toes. So I like Red Wings. That's always been a very safe brand for me. They fit me well. Uh, harder and harder to find. Uh, when I was a toolmaker, I used to wear nap shoes. Don't know if you can still buy naps. Don't know if they're still out there. No, they're gone, Frank. Okay. Completely. Uh, but I remember them well. They were fantastic. Well, interestingly, uh, back in those days, um, we didn't have to wear safety shoes in the tool room. Uh, actually, back in those days, you could wear sneakers all day in the tool room literally and then uh and then you'd finally say you know i'm ruining a lot of sneakers here with the chips he'd buy a set of safety shoes but the, the safety toes weren't even required so when i took this job i have now 15 years ago um safety shoes are required and it took me a while to get used to the weight it is surprising uh how much more weight is in those just the steel toe so i've done the sneaker ones i've done this but the, the nice leather oxford red wings i think are they, they seem to be good for me so that's just, that's the answer to that one now the second one you guys might get a kick out of i'm going to bring i'm going to share my screen now so i can uh, do my slideshow here um <clears throat> let's see before i get to that second email i'm a little out of uh sequence here tonight so um I'm going to go to another one of my favorite tools and then we'll get to that second email because there's a picture I need to see. see. So I picked these up about a year ago and uh, you're going to really like these. These are um, these brown and sharp wedge blocks. All right. And uh, I think they call them taper blocks. And if we go to the next picture here, number 672 taper blocks. Now these look really retro and they are, but this is what they look like. It's a series of wedges. And they are ground flat on one side. And you'll see this as we go through the uh, presentation here. But uh, the most important thing is, is they give you a little chart. And of course, back in those days, they routered out the lid and they put this nice uh, steel stamped uh, uh, chart in here. But I, I'm really good with my decimal equivalents, but I don't have all, I, I couldn't tell you at the top, off the top of my head what 39.64 is. I know 11 sixteenths is 0.6875. So I made my own little chart up. And the reason you need that chart is so when you want to measure a hole, you know which of these to put together. And they are incredibly accurate. Now, uh, I, I kind of put this together a little bit before I got on the air. And I want to show you uh, that. See how the one side of these? See, I hope you can see the small radius that's on them. These some Somebody thought these were adjustable parallels. They are not adjustable parallels. So basically your uh, range here, let's go back here is quarter inch to one inch. You can probably squeeze a little under quarter inch and a little over one inch, but that's the effective range. So you, you round it on one edge. And if you can see here, the other opposite side are squared edge. That's the, ed, that, that would be the side you would ring together, all right? And basically all you do is, uh, there's a picture of it right there. You slide them in your hole and, and me measure over it. These are incredibly accurate. I, I mean, I used to have to go up uh, to the, 
inspection department quite often to get um, gauge pins to check something. I love these things. I, I don't have to do that half as much anymore. And if you look, very small letters, you can see this happens to be the F wedge and the G wedge. And that would get you a certain diameter based on the um, uh, on the um, wedges you picked and the hole you're trying to measure. So the only drawback is you can't stuff them in a hole that's you know, very shallow uh, or, or, even, or has a, a blind bottom to it that they'll bottom out. But I haven't really had too much issue with that. Um, and like I said, you just use your micrometers then and measure over the arc on the uh, on the uh, wedge blocks and very accurate. Okay, so again, those are number six seventy two, brown and sharp tapered blocks. And uh, I got mine on eBay. I think they were a little more than I want to admit, but I'm going to say I spent about a hundred bucks on those. Now the second email uh, regarding we'll get rid of the work shoes here. Um, this guy sent me this picture. Now, my engineer friend, Mike, might enjoy this. This might be a riddle for Mike, but uh, this is a lot here. But I told him I'd share. This is from a guy named uh, Derek in uh, Ontario. Really enjoying the on, uh, online lessons, blah, blah, blah. Let's see. Um, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind doing a segment on angle blocks. I'm very fortunate to have this set below. I understand whole degrees, no problem. Even dealing with minutes, I think I have it straight. Example, an angle of 5.4 degrees. I multiply the 0.4 by 60 and get 24. Then I believe that I would grab the five degree block, the 20, the three, and the one minute blocks to make 5.24. Is that right? I have no idea. <laughs> Next is where do the seconds blocks come in and how do those calculations get made? Lastly, in the set, they include a parallel of a straight edge. My question is, why are they included and how might they be used with the angle blocks? If this is something you might be think it might be segment worthy, uh, and I I think it is. This looks like a really unique set, and it could be very expensive. I don't know who made this, but it looks like it's in a very nice box. And usually stuff that's in a very nice box, I I don't know. I can't tell. I, and then I see this key up here, though the key makes it look like it might be a tin key, so it might not be that vintage. So does anybody ever seen these or have any thoughts on this? Because I have thoughts on this. Okay. Um, you know, I'm old school, and when I need to do something, um, I get the sidebar out. If I really want to hit degrees, minutes, and seconds, that's my gold standard, all right? So I would probably, unfortunately, he's up in Ontario, that I would I would ask him if he can ship those to me, and I could prove out his mystery, but I, I'm not being flippant here. I, I don't know how, how uh, he's coming up with his calculations without getting my hands on these things and really seeing how they work. So, again... Uh, this video will be posted. This lesson will be posted after you know, a couple of days. And if you watch it again and you want to do the, the um, uh, what would I call it? The uh, mystery of the blocks, because as you can see too, it's, I can't see all the, the numbers and letters on these. So I'm, I'm not sure. And then you, you know, a couple of parallels at the bottom. So uh, not quite sure. Mike, is that your engineering mind thinking at all? Yeah, but uh, when I put my machinist hat on, I would only, yeah, I would use a sign bar unless if I needed five degree ish, I'd use one of these type of blocks. That's generally what I do for a setup. If I right. needed something dead on, I'd sign bar it. And these might be able to get you dead on. I'd have to play with them. All right, this is an old one. Uh, it was just, again, I said, as I said at the beginning of the meeting, I was going through uh, some photos the other night to see what uh, might be fun for you guys. But this is a typical. Thing that, that hits my bench they come running over with this now here we have a welded uh, uh some sort of an exhaust or water header this would be for a lo locomotive engine and uh it's been powder coated and they noticed that final shipment the o-ring groove on the flange is too shallow by about five thousandths it's just it's just a little too far out for me for them to ship it so can i remachine that o-ring groove all right so um, basically, as you can see here, I've got an angle plate set up. And this is a homemade angle plate. And let's face it, I'm not really, that angle plate's pretty accurate. But you can see by that setup, there, this is all going to be up to me to wrench this thing around and jack it up to get that flange on the top fairly flat. And there's another look at it. So basically, 
You can see in the back, I've got uh, uh, some clamps and, and, and risers to hold the, um, the uh, block in place, all right, the, uh, the right angle plate in place. But then my trick was to indicate this flange back and forth until it was reasonably flat. And I got it there. But the problem was, is every time I squeezed on this clamp that's holding the pipe to the angle plate, the whole thing would shift. All right. And uh, I got it. And here's one of those lessons. Um, basically, what I had to do is lay a parallel along the top and check it left to right. Then a parallel, turn it 90 degrees and check it front to back. And just, you know, I probably I wouldn't be surprised if I had an hour getting that flat. Now, the trick is, once it's flat, be very careful, right? You, you don't, you, I just, I put some dicum in there and slowly scraped it in a couple thousandths at a time. Def mic that it was right. That's one of those ones where you just go like this when you're done because, you know, um, a part like that you, with, that's clamped that high in the air, it's very easy uh, to, to, for it to slip and move on you. And that's, and again, you can see I'm using probably an eighth inch end mill in there, but that, that's just a typical problem that comes my way at work. Now, I don't know how many of you guys, um, the next one's pretty basic, but uh, a good lesson. Um, I, I power tap most of the stuff I do at work. I mean, when you've got a, a, a job and, and you've got a bunch of half 13 taps to do, you know, I remember back in the old days, we'd power tap them a couple threads deep just to get them started straight and then finish them by hand because we didn't want to break a tap. Well, you know, it's 2020 now, and we've got better taps. We've got uh, better oils, I think, or maybe some of the old guys would say the old oils are better, whatever. I try not to waste time by um, uh, uh, hand tapping too many holes. So occasionally, uh, we have to check a tap to make sure it's not running out, all right? And uh, as I'm going to show you here, uh, if a tap's running out too much, it, it, you, that's when they break. And for those of you who have never seen a power power tapping a, uh, a hole and, and had a tap blow up, it's it's not fun. It's 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 just, it's demoralizing. <laughs> it's uh you know that's going to be a, a just a, a mess to get out right. So what we'll do is uh for certain taps, if I want to really make sure, uh, I'll indicate it. So here's the problem, right? You get your dial indicator out, as you can see, the indicator ball is going to go in between the pitch on the thread. And, then, and you'll, you'll never get it indicated in. So a little trick, very simple trick, is if um, you, you need one of these um, indicators, all right? And I'll show you. I've got the number on the next slide. But you can see now that covers two threads. So as you turn the tap, you're always on a thread, and you can indicate your tap in straight or just double check it. Um, and that is a Starrett number 196B1. I think they call it a plunger indicator. So um, nice addition. In fact, I use it so rarely, I borrow one at work. I'd love to get my hands on one, but they're fairly expensive even used. But the, the other thing they're nice for too, though, is uh, if you're indicating saw cut plates or flame cut plates, they're really nice for that because on a, um, uh, uh, with a standard um, Interapid or Mijitoyo indicator, you're going to get all, your needles that's going to be jumping up and down like crazy. And, and with this, it'll smooth that out. So they're really good for that. So I could probably sweet talk my boss into buying me one of these because I do a lot of flame cut plate work. So uh, no sense of wearing out a beautiful in a rapid, um, the ball on that on a rough cut plate. So that's a little solution for a indicating a tap in to double check it, make sure it's not no run out and B for indicating rough, rough surfaces in. Got a, I've got a tip that I don't know if people have tried this or not, but uh, the uh, wood planer I have, it had uh, knives that did not have a uh, jacking screw. So your only means of adjustment were down. And I'm, I'm wondering how I can indicate a knife, a, a 16 inch long knife with an indicator and, you know, rolling that knife edge past the, the indicator with any degree of accuracy. And what I ended up doing was using a piece of either five or 10,000 feeler gauge between the indicator and the, um, and the edge of the knife. So you could see the high spot without it peaking so quickly. And I thought at the time, well, this would be great if you have a cast surface or if you have something that was really rough 
instead of you know having your indicator jump around it would it would give you more of like uh an averaging effect don't know if that's useful but just no, that, that's, a, that's a good idea that's a really good idea you could uh i i've got several strips of like 15 and uh thousands and 30 thousand shim stock at work and i i could see that being a, an option uh in the meantime until i talk them into getting me this uh to just indicate over a, sh a, 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 a piece of shim uh, stock that i i could almost hold on with a magnet even or um even some uh masking tape but uh, again, old school indicator. The nice thing about Starrett is, I don't care almost any tool I would show you guys, they still make almost everything that they've been making since like 1918. I, I don't even know how they find a market for some of this stuff, but they do. Now this came across, this is a little punch. Uh, guy, uh, my, uh, one of the owners came out and uh, he comes walking out. He's got this little carbide punch and he wants a 45 degree angle ground on the end of it interesting so i don't you know i would never say i'm an expert at grinding carbide i've ground my own carbide end mills before with a deck wool cutter grinder and i have a diamond wheel um but diamond wheels are just weird they they're really tricky to dress they tend to to me they seem to rub more than they cut but it's just a weird process but anyways so i set up my diamond wheel on my surface grinder and then i got out my uh whirly jig and i mounted my my part in after I tipped everything up on 45 degrees and I have a small sign plate, nothing would fit under the wheel. I, see, I, I was having a hard time with this. So this is what I ended up doing. I actually turned my uh, whirly jig, my spin fixture on a 45 degree angle and used the, the side of the wheel and came down on it, on it as I spun it. And let's take a look at that, what it looked like. That's from the other side. All right. Now, as you can see, if you look up there to that guard, I'm clearing the nut on that uh, one of the uh, adjustment uh, screws on that whirly jig, that spin fixture, by about ten thousandths every time it goes around. So it was definitely a tight fit, but it did come out right. Interestingly enough, a guy I really trust a lot, um, the guy who repairs all my gauges, he's on Facebook a lot. His name's John Shirk from Indicare Gauge, and he had a big apprenticeship back in the '60s. They did a lot of interesting work. And he told me, he says, you know, you're not getting a true 45 degree angle there. And I said, how, how is that? He said, there's something about when you're grinding it radially like that, but the side of a wheel, you're actually putting on a very slight concave radius. Okay. And he says, we found this out. They were building some uh, bullet stuff, uh, shell casings for the military. And they were get, kept rejecting them because the angle, they were side wheeling it. And there was a slight radius on it. And he says, we couldn't find it. And they finally did enough testing on it. Uh, we're, we're sure as heck side wheeling with that a wheel does not give you the, a perfect angle. Now, in this case, with an eighth-inch punch, you'll never see it. be millions. But on a shell that's one or two inches long, I, I, I'll get the real story from John. But I thought to myself, that's something that I've never heard taught in school. And I, it, it kind of makes sense to me. I, I I don't see how you could go straight down the side of a part with a wheel, even though it's spinning with, with a, a, a part, but he, and it, it certainly looked like 45 degrees. All right. And I, I didn't check in the comparator and for what they're going to use it for. It's fine. But if I ever uh, have a lot of time on my hands, I'll do some experimenting with the, with that one, because that's an odd one, but uh, I'll find that the post he put up and, uh, but he, he just explained what happened. He didn't really tell me what the uh, solution uh, was as far as, uh, or why that happened. I don't even think they knew why it happened, to tell you the truth. So, again, that's one more look at it. Uh, oh, and that's a close-up view. I'm sorry I missed that one. And that's just the edge of my diamond wheel coming down sideways. I'm side-wheeling that off. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, setting up and locating a large steel tube. Let's look at this one. Another oddball. Uh, three of these to do the other day. And... Uh, I've done, this is the second time I've done these. Um, basically the only way I can figure out to do this is I've got to drill two holes on the top. Big deal. The trick is, is they're located off the center line of this pipe down at the bottom. All right. So I've got to figure out a way to hold these things in straight and pick up this angle with some sort of a ball. Now, as you can see here, I've got my Heimer 3d indicator. I'm going to do a video on, on those later because they're one of the finest tools I've ever owned. But sometimes I don't trust that 3D indicator on an angle. I don't know if I'm getting what they call a coaxial error, 
So what I decided to do is go a little old school. And uh, if you look up there now, you'll see I've got this. Uh, it's just a probe. It's just a steel uh, three eighths diameter piece of steel with a, a full brown of, uh, on the end of it. All right. So I touch the top of the pipe. I'm in the center of the pipe. I'm on the high spot. And now I want to come down four inches. I've laid this out in CAD and touch the side. Well, and that's what it looks like. Now, if you look closely, and I'll, the next slide will show you even better. That is actually, this is old, uh, old school meeting, new school, I guess. That's actually a tracing stylus from when I used to run a hydrotel, tracing injection molds for models. I just don't have the heart to throw these things out. Uh, the company that made these, uh, where I used to work for, and I bought them, for them from them when I had my shop. They had an extra set. They not only made these hardened uh, and ground, of course, they're all sat and chromed. So I've got a bin of these. This one happens to be a 360 diameter ball uh, for a 360, uh, well, that's a lot more. There's the deflection you have to figure out. But anyways, I know that, not, and I checked that it's running nice and true. So now I've picked it up. Now here's what that probe looks like. I'm calling it a probe for what we're using it for. It would actually be a, a tracing stylus. But now, now I have a hard number, right? And I can come down and touch the side of that pipe very carefully with a 1,000th shim. And then I know I'm four inches down and I've got a calculation along that angle to figure back to the center of the pipe. Now, let's take a look at the setup again. There's a lot going on under this red arrow. One of the things you'll notice as I've got over there is I've got this big two-inch ball, okay, which is an old two-inch cutter that was broken off that I saved uh, many years ago and uh, was able to grind, grind the ends back to, to square, and it's mounted to a plate. And I used to use that for checking ball dimensions on uh, injection molds, and that's how we checked our angles to make sure they were right. Well. Obviously, I was working on some very large molds if I needed a two-inch ball. Well, you know, we've got a cavity five, ten inches deep. The further down you can check it to mic over a ball, the more accurate your number is going to be. So that's the reason for that. Well, so I've got my two-inch diameter ball clamped down over there. And as you can see, the pipe is bumping against that for my stop. My left and right stop is a ball. That's the only way you're going to get that angle because I've got, like I said, three or so of these to do. I want to repeat this every time. So it's going to bump up against that. Now it gets even a little trickier. Now that's everything without the um, uh, pipe in place. You can see the ball is the, and the plate is, are mounted there. But then you can see I've got a one, two, three block there. And that one, two, three block. So what I do is I put the pipe in. And if you can watch me on the video part of this, I put the pipe in and I slide it until the, the pipe kicks to the back of the machine and touches there. And then I know on when it touches that one, two, three block, I'm vertical too. So that's how I line that pipe. Um, it's, it's, it's an interesting process, but that's, that's the way. I, a lot of clamping and the setup of the corner here to get that to repeat every time. And uh, I, I know sometimes I post this stuff and guys are like, what are you doing? Are you running 100 parts? And sometimes I have to do this for three or four parts. So it's just the way it goes. Uh, uh, that machine I run, for whatever reason, it's not that big of a machine but it's got a 50 inch table and the table doesn't move. So uh, the head moves. So it's a big advantage because uh, we can do fairly large parts of this machine um, because the table won't shove the part out of the side of the machine, all right? The head moves. So I get a lot of weird stuff like this and, and, and it takes time to set this up, but this is how I tackled it. But a couple other things regarding that setup, um, that's the, that's the uh, ball, I am sure. It's a high-speed steel uh, shank off a two-inch end mill. Uh, back in the day, there's no doubt I threw that in an EDM machine and an and EDM to clearance hole for that quarter and screw to mount on to that plate, all right? Now, another issue, though, the, uh, the plate has a long enough bend in it where I had to set the vise up off the table. Now, I wasn't too concerned with a lot of holding pressure here. Uh, I want it tight, but I'm not doing a heavy milling. I'm drilling two holes, all right? So what we have here is I explained in my uh, one of my lessons, I've got several of these blocks that are two and seven eighths high, and they're the same size as uh, my table height to the bed of my, um, uh, the top of my bed of my Kurt Vice. Well, since I have three of them, I have a match set. I have two here, and then I have a bar that's two and seven eighths too. That still wasn't high enough. So then I had to put one, two, three blocks under them to get the, the height I needed. So when I put the pipe in, the pipe didn't hit the table. And I think when I was all said and done, I, I, I cleared by about a quarter of an inch there. But that's a, a simple way 
uh, for me to set that up. Now, if you look at the side view a little more, you can see, again, I've got the bar here, two and seven eighths with a one, two, three block under it. And I just threw a clamp on the end on the back just to keep it steady so we don't get any of this. I always like a third clamp on the back if, I, if, I, if I'm doing something like this. I'm, I don't have a lot of surface holding me uh, tight on the, uh, as I would on the table, number one. Number two, when that vise goes back on the table, it's, it's dowel pinned into position. So nothing's going to move on me. So when I, I always, when I have to raise the vise, I throw a third clamp on the back just to, so there's no sliding. All right. Now, uh, that was a little bit going on there. Let's see here. Uh, last week I showed you these pictures and uh, this is just a show and tell. I showed you these. Um, those are a couple of, uh, uh, burnouts they gave me to bore these holes in and i told you and i showed you a pit stock picture of a, a special plate it's called a bluco system that we use to do our weldments and i thought i was walking by the other day and i happened to see this and i said you guys might want to see that <clears throat> that, now that, that definitely looks like organized chaos there but that's all modular but you can see where the red arrow is there's that part i built and you can see the two bores in the middle or how they mount it to this angle block and it just snaps in it's really nice it's a big they could set this stuff up in just a few hours based on uh much like uh mike's system uh you can lay this whole thing out in cad and uh put a very complicated pipe you can see we got modular v blocks up here there's a lot going on here but i thought you would like to see uh there's a very simple application for that part i built last week uh, eventually i never happened to walk by one of these when the pipe is mounted to it and i will get that for you because um that's in the welding department, and I usually don't walk through the welding department. So I'm gonna have to make a, a, um, a, a effort to get to the welding department in this next before the next meeting. Then I'll show you this this system with a crazy pretzel tube pipe in it, and you know, and they hold these dimensions. I mean, I don't know how these companies even check this work that we send them, but we'll we'll put four or five elbows together, and they want true position within like five thousandths on these weld bits. It's it's hard to believe, but that's that system that I showed you last week. And finally, um, <clears throat> I was just doing this the other day. I had to measure a bore. I had a round part and I had, and I had bored the center out and I needed to measure. I just want to double check around the part to see if I was concentric. And um, there's a, the question mark. I just want to get that dimension. I have two round surfaces here. And I know this might be basic for some of you guys, but did you know they sell these little balls that snap onto your micrometers? Now they're not standard. I have two sets or two of these, one for my stare at mics and one for my uh, brown and sharp mics. And it's probably a different size for uh, midget toil mics. But the deal is, is every one of these have one thing in common. They snap over your anvil and I'll show you that in a second, but they're all 200,000 balls, all right? So all you're gonna do, let's take a look at what that looks like. You can see that just snapped onto the end of this is my one to two mics. And I've just snapped that onto the end all right, and uh, now I can measure this part. You can see I've put the ball on the, I guess that would be the convex side, and I can still use the regular anvil on the top because it'll catch the high spot. So the difference is your reading is going to be 200,000 bigger than it normally would be. You just add 200,000. So whatever you were looking for for your dimension there, if it was supposed to be 1 inch 400, it's going to be 1 inch 600, and that's okay. But that's the most accurate way. To, if you want to measure two round surfaces like that, I uh, um, it's a I, and there, I think I saw those on uh, online. They're about fifteen bucks, and the, but it's a nice addition uh, for your toolbox. And with that being said, uh, I think I'm going to open up back up to. Uh, we're going to stop the share screen sharing, and you guys can fire away with any questions. And I did try to number all the slides again this week, so if I missed something, or I misspoke, or you had a question. When this goes back up on the website uh, in a couple of days, don't be afraid to ask me slide number 41, what are you talking about? Okay. So let's bring everybody back. All right. Hmm. Hey, Phil, I've got a, a question about one of the fixtures that you showed the, the last time. Can we go back to that? Okay. Uh, did you write down the slide number, Bill? Uh, no. I think. <laughs> All right, give give me an F today. Go ahead. Oh, that's all right. What which which fixture was it? I started off. It with was it was a fixture that you were using to um, you made it to to line up a flange that was being welded onto a a pipe or a tube. Was that from last week's lesson? 
Right. Yeah, yeah, two weeks ago, right? I'd have to look at that one, Bill. I have a copy of it, but I don't know. What was your question about it? Okay. There was a uh, there was a slot in that fixture that was relatively narrow, but quite deep. And I'm wondering if you can talk about your strategy for milling fixtures like that. They're, they just are so difficult to do without getting a lot of chatter and nasty surface finish. I'm wondering how you pulled that off. You know, I, 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 I don't recall. The problem I have, I don't know if it's age, okay? But I see so many different parts on a daily basis. And then, then it goes into on a weekly basis. And Bill, that's two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. Ancient <laughs> history, I know. I'll tell you, though. It, I, um, just rewatch that video, okay? Um, it's on the, on the membership site. It's on yeah. week's lesson. Scroll through it. It's right there. Speed through it until you find that. And just say, Phil, 10 minutes in, 10 minutes, eight seconds in. This is what I was talking about. Just shoot me an email. I'll cover it in our next lesson. Okay, cool. Not, not a problem. I'm not avoiding the question, but I, I don't I don't want to miss answer it if I if I not see it correctly. You know what I'm saying? Okay. All right. Not a problem. Thanks. That goes for any of the stuff I do. I always tell you guys, don't be afraid to shoot me an email. Anything else? Yeah, Phil, I got a quick question. Okay. Um, I was told long ago, float your taps and reamers. Do you still believe that? Probably on a manual machine. All right. Uh, I, I, you know, boy, I, I'm thinking back. You know, I don't know if you guys have seen the old tapping heads they used to, to have for machines. I mean, just, I mean, uh, Mike, I know because you're always looking for um, you know, your home hobbyist. So I'm sure you're on eBay a lot and stuff. And they had these little tapping heads. And I remember using them. And then uh, it's a really complicated thing with the tap against. We have certain machines at our plant. We use a lot of Mazex at our plant. And there's a few of our machines. I don't know if the servos are just a little weird. We have to float the taps of those machines. They'll break. And when they usually break, I guess, is on, uh, on reverse. There's something in the torque in the spindle head that's not quite right. So they, they'll snap the taps. They, they, we got a pretty sharp guy who figured out we have to use a floating tap head on one machine out of 30 okay but um all the taps i run i on my mazak i run it's a uh, a 40 taper machine and i'll go about as big as a three quarter inch tap and uh i can usually go down i can power plunge a, a three quarter inch tap on that machine I'll, I'll, the farthest i've ever tapped the hole is, is almost two inches deep with lots of oil on it okay and uh holding on for dear life because I, I know if that goes it's not going to be pretty but I all all my taps are solid, no floating taps. So uh, that's a good question. Um, I just don't see that many floating tap holders anymore. But any of you guys can jump in with that because you guys do a lot more manual machining than I do. Maybe I don't know. Anybody? Bjor? Bjor? Well, <laughs> not not just manual machines, but when I was in class, we had the Host Mini Mill that it didn't have rigid tapping. Okay. So we had to have that, uh, if you wanted to say a floating tap head, because it would start to back out. The spindle will start to come up before the spindle would actually start spinning. Okay. So it because the <clears throat> the VF three I run now has rigid tapping, so we can use a tap holder or a collet, you know, something that'll hold the tap because it will start to spin and go up in Z at the same time. And so that floating tap head will keep it from, you know, trying to stretch that tap before the spindle starts spinning. And, and that's probably was made when I said earlier that it usually happens when you're coming back out, that that would be the, yeah. Answer. So good explanation. And uh, Daniel, I hope that helps because, uh, I forgot about the term rigid tapping. I've been spoiled. Obviously, the machine I run has it. And I don't have to have, deal with that problem, right? And most of the machines in our shop have it. So I, I never quite thought of that. So that's a great point. So some of the hoses will, will need the floating head, some don't. The, can I assume the newer ones, or is it a model pro difference? Uh, I think with that, it was the model because the, the mini mill only had a table that was maybe 12 by 18 okay. and the 
VF3 that I run, I want to say it's 40 by 20. But I think it's, I think it has to do with the, the option and probably the price of the machine. <laughs> right. right. So Daniel, back to your question, are you running a manual machine? Is that your question? Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm running a manual. We got a, we got a proto track, uh, similar it's mics, but it's a, it's a more up to date one. Um, I've always run different things. My question was because now I'm an old timer and an old timer taught me that like, just, uh, you know, in my apprenticeship was like, load your tap and reamers and your ream, your ream holes will come out with intense, you know, and your you will never, you know, nowadays because of you know you know you've been around in the 90s and 2000s it's rigid tapping and i wonder why we got away from that you know you you could float a reamer in, in a uh, in a big drill in a radio arm drill and, and hold the tolerance and it seems like we got away from that with rigid tapping and well that's the, the here's a big lesson for everybody though it's amazing what everybody learns during their apprenticeship right um just the different ways people do things. That's why it's always was a good thing when I was coming up in the trade to move around a little bit because every shop does things a little differently. And um, by the time I came into the trade, uh, very early on in the mid-80s, the, the CNCs were starting to come around, all right? So a lot of those old techniques for reaming and and uh, you know, doing bigger holes, we circle mill them now, right? I mean, you can do things like that. So I, uh, I would be the first to admit, I, I'm a little um, uh, probably uh, just wasn't exposed to a lot. I just remember one of our old, remember they used to call them sensitive drill presses? Just every shop had one in the corner just for tapping some holes. And they had tapping heads on them. They were crazy looking little doodads. They were cool. And I, I, I boy, now we're going back 1983. I remember running them a few times, but I... I just don't see them in use anymore, Daniel. So I, 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 I don't know. I, I and I, we were never taught to float the reamers, and I love that idea. You know, I, um, I would I have to think about that for some of my. I'd like to try that experiment at work because every once in a while I'm shocked that the some of my reamed holes don't come out where I think they should. You know, so I don't. I'm sorry I couldn't really add more to that to that, but uh, I will do some research on that. That's a good. That's a good deal. Anybody else has anything on that? Please feel free to post it after we make the video live one more thing i was going to ask mike is that uh, i saw on the videos that elon musk is uh making uh space s space x rocket motor parts with an additive uh 3d printing so it's uh you know it's something that mazak also has an additive and subtracting right on the same machine so it's 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 a coming thing it's gonna be like i don't know if they'll ever take away a machine Parts, but it's definitely uh, you know out there. Anybody who follows this stuff, it'd be probably a good technology to get into, wouldn't you think? Yeah, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a bad one to know. That's for sure. And feather in your cap if you're a young guy coming up through the ranks. All right. Anything else, gentlemen? Hey, Phil, I want to go back to your carbide punch. Okay there can be on any true cone a straight line between the point and anywhere on the circumference so if you're grinding that spinning it on its own axis long as the side of your wheel is flat that's a that's a perfect true cone no matter how you point it i don't see how it would have a radius you know any kind of a radius on it you can even get a, a true cone going on the perimeter of the wheel as long as you're directly across it and you've ground you know you've, you've dressed the wheel straight across if you tilt the axis of your carbide punch to be not parallel with the axis of the grinding wheel you're going to get a hollow ground cone but uh, on the side of it i'm gonna have to disagree with your buddy i think it's a perfectly true cone as long as the side of the wheel is flat He's really smart. He's been around longer than me, and I'm starting to wonder if he's trying to pull one over on me. You know, the old spherical cone thing. <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't send me to the tool crib for a thread stretcher, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll reread his comment, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get it to you guys. It was interesting.
I thought it was weird too, to tell you the truth. Um, but <clears throat> like I said, I don't argue with people, so I like to try and prove out what they say. As long as it's a light comment, you know, um, I have no problem with people, their theories. But again, one of the main reasons I'm doing this is questions like this. I mean, um, I, I, I mean, you really get tired if I, you post a picture or something on, on social media and these experts come out of nowhere and just kill you. You know, it's like, gee whiz, you know, it's really not that bad of a setup. But, um, you know, after a while of that, it's like, why, why am I posting here? I can post here. And if anybody has a question, I can answer it, at least defend myself I'm crying out loud. So. <laughs> like the time you sharpen the center punches and somebody came unglued. They came unglued on the center punches, didn't they? Oh, I was I was dying. I was like, "Come on, dude! It's center punches, not you." I mean, the other guy. Oh, I had a set of center punches. I don't know if you know what he's talking about. I had I had a nice cycle time on my machine. They were my father's. I'm never going to use these center punches again. So I thought, you know what? You had a whirly jig sitting right there. Just set them up. I dressed a forty-five degree angle on the wheel. And I just touched them off. I posted the picture. Every, they look great. They were great, and they're in the case. They'll probably never be used again. But when I go to the great tool room in the sky, whoever gets those is going to get a beautiful set of vintage Lufkin, <laughs> right? Center punches that are dead sharp and, and professional. And uh, uh, I had some guy on, what was it, Facebook just going nuts on yeah. What a waste of time. What's wrong with you? I said, okay. That's the way it goes on social media. So He's probably still commenting on, commenting on it. I probably took it down by now. You know, for sooner or later, I already might have booted him out of the group. I have the <laughs> ability too, you know. Be nice. <laughs> All right. Anything else? All right. Uh, oh, I would say. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to re reiterate about those, uh, the, uh, the brown and sharp uh, taper gauges that you were talking about earlier. I love those things. Yeah, I, I bought a set. And uh, I use them all the time now. That was, you know, that was the best, probably one of the best things I ever bought. And they're so, cool. They're really cool, too. They're so vintage. Yeah. But boy, they're accurate. I mean, yeah. So thank you for that. All right. So, um, again, this goes up in about two days up on uh, the membership site. Uh, it's a benefit to your membership. So you can go back and watch this. It's all going to be there. It takes about... Uh, uh, probably tomorrow night I'll download the video from Zoom because it's a long one. It'll take them a while to crunch it. Then I'll edit it and send it back up to uh, YouTube either tomorrow night or Thursday, and we'll be there for the weekend. And we'll get a, we'll get a reminder uh, for the next meeting. Uh, it'll be in two weeks again. Okay? In the meantime, stay in touch. If you have any questions, I'm always uh, willing to answer them. And always remind me, guys, hey, I was in your meeting the other night. I had a question about this because I do get a lot of emails and questions. And uh, um, it always helps to put it in perspective where it came from all right just jog my memory because i'd love to say i've memorized everybody's names right now but I, i'm not so all right so that is it from erie pennsylvania uh have a safe week two weeks be safe be strong be brave and uh we'll be we'll be back in uh two weeks in the meantime hey phil two weeks is election night all right i'll be i'll be voting it well you know what maybe is that going to screw anybody up? Seriously, uh, I, I, I'll i be voting at around 6 p.m. <laughs> yeah, it'll be close, won't it? depending on the line. Not here in Canada. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> We're up there. <laughs> voting down here. Voting Democrat. <laughs> hey, Phil. All right, all right, all right. Hey, Phil, I just saw something. Uh, this is that President Trump is holding a rally in Erie, PA. Two minutes from here. Literally, I could be there in two minutes. Oh, cool. It's. Uh, I might after I leave here. Just I just want to see Air Force One take off. Yeah. You get to see that. Cool. Well, let me think about that. That might be an issue. As any other, it's like if I wanted to switch this to a Thursday night. Does that work for anybody? Is that a problem for anybody? No problem. All right. So good. Uh, Either one's fine with me. All right. Good. Thank you for the reminder, though. You guys are right on it. I guess. All right. We'll see you uh, in two weeks and two days. Okay. Hey, uh, Phil. I have a, a question for you. Okay. Uh, it has more to do with like a resume for a machinist. Uh, I've had one job for the eh, 
almost four years. And the experience that I think I've gotten at my current job with setups, multiple parts. Um, is there any way that, you know, maybe you can help me out with what machine shops might look for in a resume? Because I have one resume for uh, an Air Force base that's local to me that occasionally hires machinists and their resume machine looks for, you know, keywords. So in your resume, you would put micrometer, you know, vertical mill, horizontal mill, depth gauge, anything to like bring out, you know, I guess ping keywords for them to give you a call back. But for other machine shops, I know a lot of the places here say, you know, minimum five years mm -hmm. or, you know, minimum seven to 10 years. But I, you know, kind of like to think that with the current job that I have, with the amount of setups I do, uh, G coding at the machine, set up, uh, rework on, you know, parts. Hey, this part doesn't work. Do this. Don't mess it up because it's already gone out to be anodized. <laughs> right, right. And, you know, how, how would you be able to put that on a resume and, you know, have a, an employer go, oh, I'm looking for somebody with seven to 10 years. You have four. No, I'm just going to crumple it up and throw it out the window. Frank, that must be right up your alley, isn't it? <laughs> I was, I perked my ears up because, uh, um, you know, a lot of times employers have this wish list. They want someone with, you know, like say, like you said, seven to 10 years experience, but, you know, the right person that comes in with four years, okay, or whatever, they'll say, hey, sold, you know. Um, it's all about presentation, okay? And documenting what you've done. You know, you have to, as a, an old boss of mine said, he says, the question you have to answer is, so what, you know? If you, you know, uh, had a lot of problems that you solved, you know, you want to, you want to paint a picture that describes your skills. And I know this is kind of vague, you know, because, because I can't get inside your uh, mind, but um, I like helping people with their resumes. Uh, so I don't know how you can. All right, so I, 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 Frank, I've got your email. If Colin, if you want to email me, all right, I'll connect you two. Okay. Okay. Right. All right. This is just a, a volunteer thing. Right. Colin, <laughs> okay. I, I just, you know, no. <laughs> I do well, it I'd like to do it. That's, that's my big thing is I know that the company I work for, uh, that a lot of the machinists that we've, well, I, I say we, that the company has hired say, you know, I've got all this programming experience. I can do this. I can do that. They're there for like three weeks and they go, uh, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and, uh, that's, I guess I would say my big fear since the machining community really isn't that big to, you know, sell myself on a resume when I can actually do this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then they look at it and go, wait, three and a half years, this guy's bullshitting me. <laughs> and I mean, that's, <laughs> I mean, to put it in a, you know, a, a, a nice way or mm -hmm. nicer way, instead of going, oh, he's got seven years, we're going to hire him. And then they hire him and they go, you don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> Some people have so, 10 years experience doing one year's worth of work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if you're a go-getter and you sound like you're competent, that comes across in the way you talk and the way you explain your work history. Uh, if Frank will work with you a little bit. If you need me to look at your resume, I write resumes for people all the time and they always get jobs. A huge pay cut, but they always get a job. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's, 
That's, hey, what do you that's want? understandable. What do you want? <laughs> you guys, I'm going to go look at Air Force One. Take care. All right, Thank you, right. Thank you We'll be in touch. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. Bye, guys. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Stay well. Good night. Good night.